Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. So welcome back to the Sunday after Easter. I said happy Easter to everybody on Sunday. I got half and half. There was the happy Easter's and then there was the, or there's three. There's the happy resurrection Sunday and there's the it's resurrection Sunday, people. Whichever category you fall into, I want to thank you guys for joining us today. So the reason why Easter is such a big thing for churches across the globe is that our entire faith is centered around one single event, the resurrection of Jesus. Because if Jesus did not raise from the dead, we are all wasting our time here today. If Jesus Christ did not raise from the dead, the Apostle Paul says that our faith is futile or worthless. There is no value in what we did. And the reason why we celebrate so much is we know the full story looking backwards. We see that Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave. We get to see the finished work of Jesus as it is outlined in the scripture. So on Easter Sunday, we all get up. We come on out to church. We put on our Sunday best. Some of us have hats that are the size of the room. And we all come out here. Why? To celebrate what Jesus has done. Easter Sunday is the biggest Sunday of the year. But what if I told you the very first Easter Sunday that Jesus didn't wake up to a packed church? What if I told you the very first Sunday that Jesus' followers actually have already lost faith in him? The very first Easter Sunday was not a celebration like we celebrate. It was a time when the disciples were hiding. They were afraid for their lives. What if I told you that the followers of Jesus were actually discouraged on that very first Easter Sunday? The reality was that Jesus had completed his mission. He rose from the grave. He had completed the very thing that the prophecy spoke of. He had done exactly what he taught he was going to do. But his followers were so stuck in the heat of the moment. They were so stuck in the fact that they saw their leader crucified, that they weren't even seeing that Jesus Christ at some points was standing right in front of them. They were stuck in the heat of the moment. And I wonder how many times have we done this ourselves? Where we are so caught up in the heat of the moment, we're so caught up in going on, on what's going on around us that we're failing to see all the good stuff that is going on. It's like when we have the, our kids' camps. If there's the kid, you know which kids' names I know the best? The kids that act up the most. The kids that are off the wall, screaming, kicking, biting. You know what kids I don't know their name? It's like, it's the end of camp. What's your name? Hi. The soft-spoken, well-behaved. It's so easy to get so fixated on what's going wrong that you can miss the sweet little girl that is doing everything right. Today, we are talking about the heat of the moment. Say that with me. Say the heat of the moment. And I think I have a story that can help us to see how this can affect our walk with God and how to push through it. So last week, as I was laying down for bed, I was using YouTube. And YouTube has this little thing that will take over your life called an algorithm. What an algorithm does is it sees what you've watched now, what you've watched in the past, and based on that, it suggests a next video. Now, I don't know how they're so good that they can know exactly what I want to watch. Like one day I was talking to somebody and I was talking about getting a mattress. Guess what kind of ads I was getting? Mattress, 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 mattress. I don't know if it's because the phone's listening or what. But this algorithm kept going and going and five minutes can quickly turn into five hours. And I ended up watching podcasts, and there was this doctor on a podcast that was talking about saunas. And I thought to myself, you know, I, I've seen saunas. I don't see why somebody would want to cook themselves like a rotisserie chicken. 
for 30 minutes at a time, but let me just watch this video. And as I watch this video talking about saunas, or it, it's a hot room, it's a really hot room, and she's talking about the health benefits of a sauna, I'm like, oh, wow, that's pretty impressive. They did a study in Finland where they, they followed 2,300 Finnish men, and they had three groups. The group, one would use a sauna once a week, then they had a group that would use a sauna two to three times a week, and then the last group was four to seven times a week. And they followed these 2,300 men over the span of 20 years, and the results were astounding to them. They found that the men who had used a sauna four to seven times a year had a 40% decrease in non-accidental death. What is a non-accidental death? Why use that term? Because a sauna is not going to protect you from a car accident. A sauna is not going to protect you from a tree falling on you. So in terms of things like dying from cancer, dying from um, heart attacks, things of that nature, that last group that used the sauna the most had the greatest benefits. So I have all this information about saunas, and the gym that I go to has a sauna. So I say, I'm going to go to the sauna. Somebody say, uh-oh, because I was so excited. It was this Monday. I get out of work. I'm all smiling. I'm like, all right, guys, I'm going to the sauna. I'll see you guys later. I'm so happy to go into this sauna. I go to TJ Maxx. I get a bathing suit. Some people like to go into the sauna with their birthday outfit on. I'd rather wear clothes. So I go. I get some clothes. I do my workout. And I finally get to the sauna. I know all the good stuff about a sauna, and I am so excited to go in there. So I go to the gym. I grab the door. I open it. And I'm like, oh, my. <laughs> I look in, and I wanted to see smiling faces like, come on. It's great. <laughs> it looked like what I think hell is going to look like. Everybody in there was sweating and looking down and struggling to breathe. They're all like, stop. I'm like, oh my goodness, what am I getting myself into? I go into the sauna, I sit down, and I'm like, oh, that's right. The average temperature of a sauna is 175 to 185 degrees. You are literally cooking yourself while you are in there. And I sit down, and I'm like, all right, I've already come too far. I told people I was going, I go quit now. And I sit down, and I set my watch for 20 minutes. That's the amount of time you're supposed to do, 20 minutes. And I'm sitting there, and I begin to sweat. I'm pouring sweat. I'm breathing heavy. I'm like, all right, this is hard, but I'm killing it. Just halfway there. Got to keep going. Halfway, you're 10 minutes in. I look at my watch. Three and a half minutes went by. I was like... We have got a problem. I was all excited about the sauna. I watched hours and hours and hours of videos about the sauna, but in the heat of the moment, guess what I wasn't thinking about? I was not thinking about the health benefits. I was not thinking about those finished men. I'm like, they lied. Ain't nobody can make it through this. All I was thinking about was the heat that I was experiencing. Was there good things going on in my body? Absolutely. Was it good for my skin? Is my heart rate increased so that it's replicating like I'm running on a treadmill? Yes, but in that moment, none of that mattered because I was focused on the heat. I had all the information that I needed, but I was focused on the heat. How many times have we done this? in our own lives. We're so focused on the heat. We're so focused on the bad things going on in our lives that we're not seeing all the good things going on around us. I want you to know today, if you've been in the heat of the moment or you are in the heat of a moment right now, I want you to know that the Bible does have a solution to this problem. And maybe you say, all right, I'm not a Bible guy. If you've ever been discouraged, I have a message for you. This idea of feeling discouraged is not something that is only in 2022. We see this happen way back in the days of Jesus. Just like I lost sight 
of what I had known because it was hot, we see that the followers of Jesus had lost sight of what they were called to do because the heat of the moment surrounding the death of Jesus. You might think, well, surely the people that walked and talked with God in the flesh wouldn't be disappointed. They wouldn't be discouraged. They wouldn't fall into this trap. Actually, they would. Watch what Jesus taught his disciples leading up to his death. Luke chapter 9, verse 21. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. So Jesus says, before he dies, he says, I'm going to be turned over, I'm going to be betrayed, I'm going to die, and I am going to rise in three days. Watch the next passage in the book of Luke, chapter 9, verse 43. Jesus comes down off of a mountaintop, and he's transfigured. His face is shining, and he goes down. He casts out a demon. Everyone's like, let's go. That's my boy, Jesus. And watch what he says to them. But while they were all marveling at everything that he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, he says, let these words sink into your ears. Let these words sink into your ears. It's like a mom that's about to go to work and the sink is full. She pulls her kids, let these words sink into your ear. In 12 hours, that sink is going to be empty. And make sure you wash the sink out after you're done. If you don't wash the sink, the dishes ain't done, right? He says, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. He's saying, I'm going to be turned over. Talking about his death and his crucifixion once again. Second time, watch this. Luke chapter 18, verse 31. The third time now. And taking the twelve, his disciples, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he, and he's speaking about himself, for I will be delivered over to the Gentiles, be mocked, shamefully treated, and spit upon. And after beating me, they will kill me, and on the third day I will rise." Three times, Jesus tells his followers, I'm going to be betrayed, I'm going to be beaten, crucified, and on the third day, I am going to rise. And what, guess what happens? We see very clearly Jesus saying he's going to rise. He says, what we call Good Friday, I'm going to die. On Easter Sunday, I'm going to rise. But guess what happens on Good Friday when Jesus is crucified? All his followers scatter. They are gone. In the heat of the moment, all the information that Jesus had given to them wasn't as relevant anymore. All the words that he had taught them in their minds, it was not at the front of their mind. They didn't say, wait a second. He said he's going to rise after three days. No, they ran and they hid for their lives. Peter went back to his old job. And I think the same thing is true in our lives. It's one thing for Jesus to say, I am your healer, I am your provider. It's another thing when we're feeling sick. It's another thing when our phone is ringing and we don't want to answer because we don't have the money to pay the debt collector. And I don't blame his disciples for running in this moment. Because imagine you dedicated your entire life to following this man. And for the first time since you began to follow him, he speaks no more. I've dedicated my whole life to following Jesus. And for the first time ever, I don't see his chest moving as he's breathing. I dedicated my whole life to following you. But yet, you're dead and hanging on a tree. I want to ask you today, what do you do when the words that God has spoken and what you're seeing aren't lining up? What do you do when the words that God has spoken and what you are seeing are not lining up? 
This is a reality that all of us are going to face at some point in this journey called life. And this is what the followers of Jesus had to deal with firsthand. When we go to the first, the very first Easter Sunday, we find it in Luke chapter 24. So keep in mind, Jesus was beaten at this point. He was crucified, but now he's raised from the dead. The very first Easter Sunday, he has done everything that he said he was going to do. He returns to earth. He goes to, not returns to earth. He rises from the dead, goes to his disciples, and let's see how they receive him. That very day, in verse 13, two of his followers, the disciples, were going to a village named Emmaus. Everybody say Emmaus. Remember that name. Say it one more time. Emmaus. We're going to come back to it. It says about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about everything that had happened, the death of Jesus. It says, while they were talking and discussing together, so they're talking about the death of Jesus, it then says that Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. They're standing here, frozen and sad, because Jesus is dead. As Jesus is standing right next to them saying, what are you guys talking about? He's accomplished everything that he was called to do on this earth. He has made the payment to restore humanity back to our Heavenly Father, God and they're sad about Jesus being dead as Jesus is right there talking to them. Verse 18, then one of them, Cleopas, answered him saying to Jesus, are you the only person in Jerusalem that doesn't know what's going on right now? I just imagine Jesus standing there like, I don't know what is happening. You tell me. They're talking to Jesus like, you don't know what's going on. And the reality is Jesus was the only one in that conversation that knew what was going on. He says to them, what are you guys talking about? And they stood still, being sad, saying, haven't you heard? Jesus is dead. Our Lord, our teacher, our master is dead. They are standing in the very presence of the risen Savior, sad because he is dead. They're so focused on the heat of the moment that they're missing that God is speaking to them. You can be in the presence of God and so focused on the heat of the moment and the things going wrong in your life that you can miss the fact that he's standing right there next to you. They find themselves of, in this moment of wanting nothing else but to have Jesus. And the exact thing that they were looking for was right next to them, but they missed it because of how they were feeling. I want to encourage you today. In the heat of the moment, in those times when life is difficult, when everything feels rough, I want you to know that Jesus is right there with you in the middle of those situations. Even in those moments where we miss it, the moments when we are faithless, Jesus is still faithful to be right there with us. I want you to imagine something. You're supposed to pick up somebody at 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock on the dot, and every single time you get up from what you're doing, you go to meet them at 8 o'clock, but they don't come outside till 8.15. What are you doing after four days? You say, I'll see you at 8, and then at 8.05, you're getting off the couch to get there at 8.15, right? We serve a God that knows we're going to mess up, knows we're going to be late, but every single time, he is still there with us. It's like mind-blowing that God will look at each individual in this room 
As I'm looking, what do I see? I see a crowd. I can pick out one or two faces if I'm really focused. God sees each and every one of you. He knows each and every one of you by name. He loves each and every one of you. He knows all the mistakes we're going to make, and yet he is still faithful. This is the God that we serve. I want to encourage you in those moments where we feel like we're stuck in the heat, like it might feel like God has left us. I want you to encourage you to push forward, to not quit, to not give up, because God is right there with you. Just like these guys, Cleopas and somebody else, they were so sad about Jesus being dead, yet Jesus was right there with them. And as we're going to see in a little bit, he actually encourages them in this down moment. Watch this. We see earlier in the teachings of Jesus that he does not promise that life is going to be easy. Many times we want to think, all right, if I'm a Christian and I'm serving a good God now, then all of life's problems are going to disappear. Lord, I'm serving you, so you know you've got to send those kids off to space because they don't listen. <laughs> Lord, I'm serving you. you know, my spouse, they don't listen. You can send them to Jesus. Lord, my boss, ooh, she gets on my nerves, Jesus. You can send her too. And we want God to get rid of every other problem without realizing that we're the problem. We want life to be a perfectly smooth road, but this is not what Jesus promises. You know what Jesus does promise? You are going to have troubles in this life. He promises that we're going to have troubles, but then he says, but take heart. But be encouraged, I have overcome the world. He doesn't say life is going to be perfectly smooth. He says something better. He says life's going to be bumpy, but take heart, you're connected to the one that has overcome the world. I want you all to know today that Jesus Christ, when he laid down his life for us, when he made the sacrifice, when he connected us back to the Father, when he overcame the world, that there's a set of promises that he's given to us. Promises to never leave us or forsake us. Promises to stick closer than a brother. And when we hold on to these promises, we hold on to the one that has overcome the world. Yes, they are problems. Yes, there are issues. But we got to let our problems know I'm connected to the one that is victorious. I'm connected to the one who makes a way when it seems like there is no way. So let's see, what does Jesus do in this moment when his followers are focused on the heat? It's clear that they're not getting it. It's clear that they need some guidance. Watch what verse 25 says. Jesus said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all, the all that the prophets have spoken. Didn't the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And in verse 27, it says, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. In the moment where Jesus could have done anything. He could have communicated to them any way he wanted. First service I talked about, what's her name? Edna from The Incredibles, a little three foot tall girl. And there's big strong Mr. Incredible. And he's sulking and he's sad like these guys are. She takes a newspaper, she goes, pull yourself together. <laughs> Mr. Incredible. Jesus could have said, pull yourself together. I'm standing right in front of you. But he doesn't. In the moment when they need guidance, he points them to the scriptures. In moments when we need guidance, where do we get our answers? From the scriptures. We might say, well, Jesus was standing right there. Why didn't he just talk to them? Here's the thing. He did through the scriptures. It's like, as I was reading this story, I have the picture in my mind. Okay, there's Jesus speaking, and then there's the word of God. They're two different things, but no. 
They're one in and of the same. God speaks to us through his word. We say, God, I just want to hear your voice. And a lot of times we have a picture of closing our eyes and pulling our ears up. I want to hear your voice. When the real picture should be our eyes are open and our faces are down as we hear God's voice through his word. I want you to know that God speaks through his word. And as we look back to the original question, I believe that it gives us real clarity on how to move through the heat of the moment. So what do we do when the words that God has spoken and what we're seeing are not lining up? Point number one, we look to God's word. We look to God's word. What does God say about the situation that you're going through? What does God say about the moment that you're in right now? About the heat of the moment? This Saturday, we had prayer. And long story short, there's a church member here that the doctors were saying things weren't looking good for our eye. They were saying there's spots on our eye and they were going to go look for cancer. And she got up here and she said, I am standing on these scriptures. She said, I'm going to speak the scriptures in this situation. What did you guess what happened? They go in and they look and they look again. And eight different doctors come into the room. Guess what she is? Healed in the name of Jesus, just like she was saying. I want you to know that the Word of God has the power to transform. The Word of God has the power to transform our lives from the inside out. I looked up the definition of transform, and it means to make a thorough or dramatic change in the form, appearance, or character of something. And I looked at that like, yeah, transform. I'm going to find a cool sermon point. And I just started thinking about Transformers instead. In Optimus Prime. They say, who here, wave at me if you heard of the Transformers. Or Optimus Prime. So what Optimus Prime is, is he's the leader of the Transformers. And he drives around as a truck. So when he's driving around, he's still, he's still Optimus. But when he transforms, you better watch out. When Optimus transforms, the Decepticons better watch out. When this church transforms and walks forward in the power that God has given to us, the world better watch out because Optimus has a shield. We have a shield of? Shield of? Faith. We just did armor of God. Optimus, if you look at his armor, he has a breastplate. We have a breastplate of? Righteousness. He has a sword of? When we see the things that God has given to us as he transforms us from darkness into light, it's so clear that all things have passed away. Behold, you make all things new. This transforming power is all contained in the word of God. It changes us from the inside out. The heat of the moment can try to take us out from the outside in. But even in those difficult circumstances, I want you to know that God can transform us from the inside out. And there is power in his word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. All scripture is breathed out. By God. We sing a song here a lot. God, it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. What is the breath of God? What is the breath of God? His word. God's word. As Pastor Mike was talking a few weeks ago about the sword of the spirit and the power of speaking the word of God, I want us to know that that power is available to us today. When I was in the sauna and I was getting really hot, you know what I would do? Take a sip of water. It didn't make the room any less hot, 
but it made me feel a lot better. I want you to know today that God's word has that power in our lives. That when we're in a sauna, it's not the time to run from water. It's the time to grab that gallon jug and begin to take in more and more and more. Because yes, my body has to put out more. And yes, in difficult circumstances, it is a very stressful. But I promise you, when you take up the word of God and you pour back in as your body's pouring out, in those moments, you'd be surprised at how God can sustain you through these difficult moments. I believe that's the reason why, as a church, we see in the epistles, it talks about the importance of being a light. It talks about the importance of others seeing God in us. I believe that we're going to go through things, like Jesus says, there are going to be troubles. But when we walk through those troubles with a smile, with love for those who are around us, when we walk through those troubles, still caring about the people that are around us, people say, there's something different about you. What is that? You know what people are seeing? They're seeing Christ in you. As we keep reading on in the story, watch what happens. The people, they get near to the village where they're going to stop. But, and Jesus acts as if he's going to keep walking. They say, no, please stay here with us. For it is evening and the day is now far spent. So Jesus goes in to stay with them. It says in verse 30 that when he was at a table with them, this is a communion cup if you can't see it, he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. And in that instant, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Their eyes were opened and they recognized him. He breaks the bread and they finally get it. Why? I believe it's because at the Last Supper, Jesus broke the bread and he gave it to them. When Jesus feeds the 5,000, he broke the bread, he blessed it, and he gave it to them. In the wilderness, Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The Israelites, way in the Old Testament, bread would fall from heaven. Jesus Christ is the daily bread. We say, give us this day our daily bread. What's my point? If God's done it before, he can do it again. If God has done it before, he can do it again. They finally get a revelation of who's at the table with them. The Bible says that their eyes were opened. That word eye doesn't mean that they physically saw him because they had seen him physically already. It's this word ophthalmos that means the eye of your mind. Their mind's eye was open to who was there with them. So we do step one. We look to God's word. Is that enough? Is that where we stop? That's not where we stop. We've got to move the scriptures from our mind into our heart. From our mind into our heart. We're going to do an exercise today. Everyone get two fingers. Pointers, please. Not, you know, this church. i got to say it. <laughs> And take those two fingers and put them on your head. We go from our mind to our heart. From our mind to our heart. From our mind to our heart. Come on, keep up. Mind, heart, mind, heart, mind, heart. We move the word from our mind into our heart. Why? Because when head knowledge of who Jesus is in our life becomes heart knowledge, then things begin to look a whole lot different. These guys have been walking with Jesus, hearing the voice of God. They were walking right next to him in their sadness. But when the eye of their mind was opened, when they got a revelation of who was right there with him, everything changes. Of course, it says in the very next verse that he vanished. Like, 
he was gone. They look at each other. They say, weren't our hearts burning inside of us? It's like a, I knew it. I knew it type of thing. They're saying we felt something different going on in that moment. I want you to know today that in those moments where the heat is turned up and life feels difficult, I don't want us to go into those moments with just head knowledge of who God is. I want that word to be deposited into our heart. In this story, Jesus is at the table with them. They're in the heat. They're sad. They're going through it. They believe that their God, their king, their master, their teacher is dead. If you're in a moment right now where life is difficult, where it might even feel like, does God even see me? Does God even hear me? I want you to know that God is at your table. God is at your table right there with you in the midst of the circumstances. In the New Testament, we see that we have the Spirit of God living on the inside of us. What does that mean? It means if I try to run out that door as far away as I can from God, guess where God is? Right there with me. If I try to run, you know, God, I'm going to run as far into sin as I can. Guess where God is? Dwelling on the inside of you. We have to realize that God does not stay with us because we are perfect. God stays with us because he is perfect. God does not stay with us because we are perfect. He stays with us because he is perfect. As these disciples understand who is at their table and they have a revelation, I believe that it gave them the strength once again. It says in this, in the next part of the story, that they haul it back to Jerusalem to share the news of the risen king. Why? Because a revelation of who God is will sustain you in the heat of the moment. A revelation that inward knowing of who God is will sustain us in the heat of the moment. How do I get a revelation? I called my dad about this because I wasn't too sure. I was like, Dad, is it us getting into the scripture and then we get the revelation? Or is it simply we almost sit there and something jumps out? It seems to be both. That we spend time examining God's word and God's word spends time examining us. And in those moments, something might jump out the, off the pages and we hold onto those things. As we spend time in God's word and we let, we work the word and let the word work us. I believe that there's no circumstance that we're going to go through that is more powerful than the word of God. So what, Pastor Josh? We got all this knowledge about God's word. I want you to know whatever situation you're going through, I hope it looks a little bit different now. I hope we don't look at our situations as bigger than our God. I hope in moments where we might feel like we're going to be done, we're done for sure. I hope that we now would look into God's word and find a word to hold on to just like Miss Patty did. And not just hold that message in our minds, but hold that word from God in our hearts. And now what do I do? Don't stop. Don't stop. If you want to quit, don't stop. Don't stop. I was listening to a podcast, and it was a marathon runner. Marathon runner and I think they're called super marathons. Like they run 100 miles. Sauna looks great at that point, right? It's, it is a bed and breakfast. And the interview is saying, yeah, but don't you like have a moment where you want to die almost? And she, she said, yeah. He's like, so what do you do? She said, don't stop. Don't stop. She's like, I'm capable of a lot more than I can if I let my mind stop me. I want you to know, don't stop. That you can do, get through a whole lot more than you think with God on your side. We don't know a lot about this place named Emmaus in the Bible. 
But here's two things we know. Number one, the name Emmaus means hot spring. So that I was like, you mean sauna? Oh my goodness. They're on their way to the hot spring. It means hot spring. The second thing that we know is that it was connected to Jerusalem, the city of peace. I want you to know when you're in those difficult moments, it does not mean that you're disconnected from the peace of God. When you're in those difficult moments, I want you to know you still have access to the promises of God. As you look at Jesus, we see his disciples are freaking out because they're on a ship that is sinking. Where's Jesus? Fast asleep. Peace in the storm. Peace in the difficult moment. I want you to know today that the peace of God, like we said before, doesn't mean that life is perfectly peaceful. It means in here, with the power of the Holy Spirit, I can encounter God's peace even when it doesn't make sense. Philippians 4, verses 6 to 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and guard your minds in Christ Jesus. It will guard your heart and guard your mind in Christ Jesus. Has anybody here ever had a situation and they make a crazy story in your mind and you actually go through it and it's like, that's not so bad. Many times we use our minds against ourselves. I want you to know that as we're fixated, as it says in the last three words, in Christ Jesus, that we have a guard for our hearts and a guard for our minds. And if you're here today and you're saying, yeah, I get in Christ Jesus, but you feel that doesn't yet apply to you, like you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, I want to lead you through a prayer that we all pray together. And this is simply you saying, I'm going to make Jesus the Lord of my life. Repeat after me. It goes like this. Dear God, I come to you today just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I believe that you died and rose for me. Come into my heart. Come into my life to change me and make me new. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, real quick before we head out, is there anyone here that prayed that for the first time? We just want to celebrate you together. Can you wave at me? If anybody, I see you. I see you guys in the back. Anybody else? I see you. Congratulations on making the best decision of your life. If you're one of those people that made that decision to follow Jesus today, I want to encourage you to stop by one of the tables at the back or stop by the main lobby. We would love to help you with your first steps as a new believer. Let's pray before we head into our week. Father, we come to you today in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, I thank you that your peace that surpasses understanding would fill this room right now. I pray, God, in moments throughout this week where we might be stressed, we might be anxious, that we would remember your words where you're saying as we fixate on you that your peace would guard our hearts and guard our minds. I thank you, Lord, as we go into this week that everything we set our hands to will prosper and be successful. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Have a great week, everybody. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel, and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. 
you can head on over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.